Yes. After all, like all day, it was like sort of on and off good weather. <laughs> yeah, we should not have been outside. I think I sleep outside today. So I was going to look at your window at all? It's my back. Oh, I guess that's true. So much light. And I have I not been I have not been in this since noon. Oh. Too busy. That's not what I was trying to say. No, I know. <laughs> Welcome again. We have new people here, and it looks like you guys have already found the food, which is excellent. We will also have food at 3.10 and 4 o'clock tomorrow and Friday, so if you want to come and support fellow luncheons, please do. Um, and then also this is stored on YouTube and is also live cast, thanks to Alex, so you can go back and watch Cindy over and over and over again um, if you want to. So, right, mom, dad. Uh, well, Cindy came, she's my advisee and hails from San Francisco, California. It's been a wonderful four years. <laughs> and she's doing what most Laurentians are doing, which is gap years to just figure out what to do with life and things like that. Although it's kind of a millennial trendy thing, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's been a pleasure. And so we will now turn her loose with the fourth beer talk in our 16, seven, excuse me, 17 um, senior seminar. We for the majority of beer talk. Well, it's a quarter of the subject. Talk. Yeah, so excellent. Take it away, Cindy. All right. Hi, my name is Cindy Guan, and today I'll be presenting uh, my project entitled Elucidating the Roles of Zinc and Copper in Fermentation. <laughs> All right, so humans have had a long history of consuming alcohol, as you might very well know. Um, archaeological evidence dates the um, earliest firm evidence of um, intentionally fermenting fermented beverages to around 10,000 BC, so Stone Age. Um, but more recently uh, is the oldest archaeological evidence uh, dating uh, the creations of wines, and that would be around 6,000 BC in the area of Georgia. And even more relatively recently than that um, is the oldest archaeological evidence of beer, which dates to 5,000 BC, around there. And um, that is found in the area of Iran. Um, humans have also used alcohol in a variety, a variety of other um, purposes, such as in medicine or in religious ceremonies. But my focus of this talk today is going to be about alcohol, the beverage. 
Right, so when we think of alcohol beverages, modern day alcohol beverages, we usually think of beer, wine, sake, Japanese rice wine, and um, spirits, which are created via distillation. But in terms of wine, beer, and sake, they're all produced via fermentation processes. Um, we have this starting material, grapes for wine, barley for beer, and rice for sake, and the starches in those starting materials are converted to alcohol via fermentation, and more importantly, with the help of our little friend, yeast. Yeast is a very interesting organism. Um, we use that in a lot of biological studies because it's a model organism. Um, it's a single cell eukaryote, so it's similar to humans, but more simple and smaller. Um, it's very well characterized, so we know a lot about its genome, its uh, characteristics, its proteins and such. And it has a very short lifespan, so it can be grown easily and quickly in the lab. And um, we can look at multiple generations of yeast um, very quickly. So it has a very diverse range of applications in such fields such as um, functional genetics, um, where we look at gene and protein interactions. Um, we can also use yeast to study things like the cell cycle and tangentially um, aging processes. And also we can look at metabolic um, studies using yeast. And so, um, where is yeast exactly in alcohol creation processes? Well, let's take a look at the beer brewing cycle. Um, it's a little bit small, you don't mind the words. <laughs> um, but we start off with grains for beer, um, and then the starch is extracted from beer in the milling step. Then in the mashing step, the uh, extracted starch is put in with uh, warm water so that the enzymes in the grain are um, going to convert the starch to sugars. Then in the boiling step, guess what happens? The liquid is boiled. <laughs> so this does two things. Well first, um, this sterilizes the beer. So when you drink it, you don't you know, get sick because of various microorganisms that might be in there. Also in this step, you add hops. And that's going to impart a lot of the flavors that you think of when you're drinking beer. Um, finally, the next step is where fermentation occurs. So this is where the yeast is pitched, thrown in, um, and at controlled temperatures, the yeast is allowed to um, eat up the sugars and convert that into alcohol. Um, finally, all of those particulate matters in the beer are filtered out, and it's packaged and sent to your mouths. <laughs> <laughs> So when we think about beer types, um, we usually think of three, three different kinds. We have ale, lager, and Belgian beer. And these can be distinguished by the type of yeast that are used in the beer. So for ale, that's the, going to be representing the majority of the beer types that are sold today. And the yeasts that are used in ale um, are going to be top fermenting yeast. So that means that in the fermentation step in the beer brewing process, they um, produce this pillowy, squishy foam that sits at the top of the liquid. Um, with the lager beer uh, in the fermentation process, they don't do that, so they're called bottom fermenting yeast. Um, and the Belgian beer use different kinds of yeast, but the, what distinguishes the Belgian beer from the ale and lager beer is the beer burn process itself, which I won't go into the details of. So you can imagine fun stuff. <laughs> So a question we'd like to ask when we're thinking about beer is how can we make it better? Well, oh, brewers have several beliefs, well, many beliefs actually, um, on how they can improve fermentation. And here are just several um, uh, techniques that they use to do so. Um, one thing that some brewers believe is that adding zinc, zinc supplements improve yeast vitality. Now, what do I mean by vitality? Um, it means that well, here's an analogy. Think about you as a worker. You're gonna get tired after a long day of work, right? Well, yeast get tired too when they sh ferment sugar to alcohol after a long day. Um, so zinc, supposedly, will supplement the yeast so that they can convert sugar to alcohol faster after a long day of work, okay? Now, Germans like to do something special where they do the boiling process in copper kettles. Um, Copper itself has a very, has a, there's a physical, chemical reason why copper is great for this boiling step, and that's because copper is a good conductor. So it can evenly and quickly redistribute the heat um, 
during the boiling step into the liquid, and that makes for a good quality beer. But is there a more biochemical basis for why these things might be good for improving fermentation? Well, in order to answer this question, I would have to talk about fermentation um, in terms of a biochemical sense. So this is fermentation, the metabolic process. Um, we start with glucose sugar, um, and then we go through the step of called glycolysis, which converts the glycose, or sorry, glucose into pyruvate, um, as well as ATP, an energy-rich molecule, and NADH, which is an electron carrier. Um, for fermentation, um, there needs to be an absence of oxygen in the cellular environment. And so when there's an absence of oxygen, um, the pyruvate gets converted to carbon dioxide, and that um, contributes to the carbonation of the beer. So that's why you get that nice, fizzy, refreshing feeling. And <laughs> it's also converted into acetaldehyde. And then with the help of NADH, the, uh, the electron carrier, the acetaldehyde is converted to ethanol or alcohol. Another thing that helps in this final step of converting acetaldehyde to alcohol um, is something called alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, and you might be wondering, what is alcohol dehydrogenase? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's an enzyme. Uh, what is an enzyme? It is a protein that helps a biological reaction take place. And sometimes enzymes need a little help too with something that's called cofactors. And cofactors are not proteins, but um, they, they aid the enzyme in its uh, action, basically. Um, so as an example, NADH is a cofactor in that last step of converting acetaldehyde to ethanol. And also, interestingly, zinc and copper are also cofactors. Um, in this case, zinc is a cofactor for our alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, so if you look at this little diagram, it's here helping convert the uh, acetaldehyde to ethanol here. Um, and then copper is going to be a cofactor for another enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. And this isn't involved in fermentation, but a different metabolic process. It's involved in a metabolic process called respiration. So if you recall, I mentioned that um, glucose is converted to the pyruvate um, in glycolysis, and then in the absence of oxygen is converted to an energy-rich molecule in fermentation. But when there is oxygen present, it um, is the pyruvate is shuffled instead into the mitochondria, or it goes through something called the Krebs cycle, pops out some carbon dioxide, and then NADH again. And then that is shuffled through something called the electron transport system or transport chain um, to produce ATP and water. And respiration produces a lot more ATP than um, fermentation does. So here's a, just a little close up of the electron transport chain and how that works. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, so I don't want you to um, think or look too closely at like what's going on otherwise. <laughs> you could spend a while. But you have your NADH, an electron-rich um, molecule, and it's broken down into NAD plus and protons and electrons. And those electrons help pump the proton across the mitochondrial membrane. Um, and then the electrons shuffle along through these um, various protein channels, one, two, three, and four, and um, more electron-carrying um, molecules are broken down um, and those uh, protons are then going to be pumped across these different channels. And then finally, in the last step, ATP is going to be produced. So what I want you to take away from this is that cytochrome C oxidase, the enzyme, is working here at this fourth protein channel um, during this uh, electron transport chain. And that's where the copper, as a cofactor for cytochrome C oxidase, is going to work. Um, so. If you note, at all these various junctures of these protein channels, um, protons are being pumped across. So you're getting a gradient of protons um, from one side of the membrane to the other. And so this difference in charge due to that gradient is going to be called the mitochondrial membrane potential, or MMP. So keep that in mind. I'll talk about this more a little bit later. So from 
that information, I have hypothesized that zinc and copper increase MMP during fermentation and restoration. Okay? But keep in mind that the shuffling of protons across the mitochondrial membrane is a very dynamic process. So how are we going to measure this dynamic process? Well, I use something called Rhenamine 123, which looks a little something like this. Um, it's a small, positively charged uh, molecule that can cross um, membranes like the mitochondrial membrane easily. And so it's very useful as a proton sensor. Another thing is that it's a fluorescent dye. So it is of interest to us, and I'll tell you why. Um, here I'm going to explain a little bit about what fluorescence is, because you might not know what that is. So this is going to be an energy level diagram where lower energy is down here, higher energy is down here. And you have a molecule that's at ground state, so it has a certain amount of like, basal energy, resting energy. Then you have some energy come in in the form of light that excites this molecule. So the molecule absorbs this light and gains energy, and it goes into something called an excited state. Um, when it's excited, um, it does a little bit of relaxation, so some of that energy goes towards um, the bond vibrations of the molecule. And then um, it goes back down from the excited state to the ground state. And in doing so, releases proton again. But this proton is going to be a different energy level uh, than the protons that were used to excite it in the first place. And because of this difference in energy level, you can distinguish the light that's coming in versus the light that's coming out off of the fluorescent molecule. And so that's what that is. That light that's coming off of that molecule is what fluorescence is. So we measured fluorescence with something called a flow cytometer. Um, what we do is we take our cell samples, so our yeast that have been tagged with our fluorescent dye, the rhodamine-123, and we shuffle the um, cells past the path of this laser one by one. And when the laser hits the cell, it'll fluoresce and emit um, photons that are then redirected um, through these mirrors and filters through these detectors. And then those are connected to the computer, so it sends off the data that can be analyzed to the computer. And these different detectors correspond to um, the different range of um, frequencies that we can detect, or that uh, come off from that laser, such, or from that excited molecule. So in our instance, rhodamine-123, we know, um, will emit photons at a, at a wavelength of 550 nanometers. So we're using this uh, detector FL1 to um, detect that wavelength. All right, so when we look at the flow cytometer data, we might get something that looks like this. Um, this is a scatter plot. And on the x-axis, it's going to be the logarithmic, um, what's it called, the logarithmic of scale uh, fluorescence intensity for, uh, that the FL1 detector um, detects. And then on the y-axis is also the logarithmic scale of a different detector, FL3, um, for detecting fluorescence intensity. And so you note that all these little dots are different cells. Now, um, when we put a sample through the flow cytometer, usually um, it will analyze um, around 10,000 cells. And so that's a lot of information from a sample and as represented by this graph. Um, it's really hard to condense that information into something that you can easily analyze. So how do we do that? Well, here we'll have a little histogram where, again, on the x-axis, it's going to be the a logarithmic scale fluorescence intensity detected by the FL1 detector. And then the y-axis is going to be the cell counts that are fluorescing at that certain intensity. All right? And you know, a pretty nice, cool um, uh, Gaussian <coughs> distribution, almost. <coughs> Not quite. Um, so you can represent this. Uh, you can represent this um, distribution using this ge geometric mean, which is a measure of the central value of this dis distribution. All right. So going back. So how did I treat? My yeast, or what did I do with that? Um, I used four different kinds of yeasts. I had lager yeast, ale yeast, 
brew yeast, um, which is an all-purpose uh, brewing yeast uh, for beer, and then champagne yeast, which is a wine yeast. Um, and then I stuck them in a nutrient-rich broth that they were allowed to grow and replicate and produce in. Um, YPD, um, which contains glucose, which is a fermentable carbon source, or YPG, which is going to contain glycerol um, instead of glucose, but is otherwise identical to YPD. And that's a non-fermentable carbon source. So that presumably um, forces the yeast to respire rather than ferment. Um, and then that is going to be left as is, or the broth is going to be supplemented with either zinc or copper um, at a concentration of 0 0.01 grams per liter. And then um, after wash, and then after that, we washed the yeast and um, stained it with the rhodamine 123 fluorescent dye, and then um, put the samples through the flow cytometer. And so you might be asking, what's the relationship between rhodamine 123 fluorescence and the mitochondrial membrane potential? Here's a little graph to il illustrate what's going on. Well, um, the blue represents lager yeast, and the red represents the ale yeast. And you've got different, or you've got the YPD here, and then YPD with the addition of sodium azide over here. And then x-axis is, or the y-axis is going to be the geometric mean fluorescence intensity. So in the nutrient broth alone, we have a fairly low um, fluorescence intensity for both uh, the lager and the ale yeast. But with the addition of sodium azide, um, we have an increase in the fluorescence intensity. Why is that? Well. I'd have to explain what sodium azide is first. Uh, sodium azide is a very toxic chemical. Um, don't play with it at home, kids. Uh, it um, will hinder the mitochondrial uh, uh, metabolic processes that are occurring in the yeast. So what you're seeing here, at least um, with the AO, when you see this dramatic increase in the fluorescence intensity due to, uh, due to the addition of the sodium azide, um, that's probably because I've killed a lot of the yeast cells, so they're not <laughs> And then um, with the lager yeast, you also see this uh, increase in the fluorescence intensity, but not so much as this dramatic increase here. So, to summarize, uh, the rhodamine fluorescence um, and the mitochondrial number potential have an inverse relationship, okay? Now let's look at the data. Um, first, with the zinc supplementation, um, all the different colors represent the different uh, yeast species I've used. And again, on the bottom are the various nutrient broths and supplementations. And on the y-axis, it's going to be the geometric mean fluorescence intensity. And so if you look here, overall with the YPD, so the um, group that is supposed to ferment, versus the YPG, the group that is supposed to um, respire, you'll note overall like a decrease in fluorescence intensity for the YPG group versus the YPD group. Um, also, uh, with the lager yeast, you'll note that the fluorescence intensity is decreasing with the addition of zinc for both the fermentable condition and the respiratory conditions here. Uh, with ale and brew, um, you'll note that for uh, YPD, it increases in fluorescence uh, fluorescence intensity and decreases in the y or in fluorescence intensity for the YPG, and then for champagne, there's an increase of um, fluorescence intensity um, with the addition of zinc in the YPD, but then a decrease uh, with the addition of zinc uh, for the YPG. Um, and then for copper, you'll note a similar trend with the lager in that across the board, uh, with the addition of copper, you see a decrease in fluorescence intensity. And again, with ale and brew, um, it alternates between decreasing in intensity for uh, the YPD and then increasing in intensity for the YPG. Um, and then in champagne, you see an increase in fluorescence intensity for both, um, for both uh, broth types. So to summarize, because that's a lot of information, um, we see an increased mitochondrial membrane potential for YPG versus the YPD broths. And as a reminder, the YPG broth is the one that induces respiration, whereas the YPD is the fermentation um, broth. So we pres I presume that this is because um, during the respiration process, 
you're producing a lot more ATP than you are for the fermentation process. Um, and because of that, there's a lot more protons being carried off, um, pumped across the mitochondrial membrane. And so that would explain why there is a greater mitochondrial membrane potential and hence lowered uh, fluorescence intensity uh, for the YPG versus the YPD. With the lottery yeast, you see an improved mitochondrial membrane <coughs> potential with zinc and copper supplementation for both the fermentation conditions and the respiration conditions. For the ale and brew, you see an improved mitochondrial membrane potential with the zinc and copper uh, supplementation in the fermentation conditions, but a decreased mitochondrial membrane potential in the um, uh, respiration conditions. And then for champagne um, yeast, you're seeing improved mitochondrial membrane potential with um, the supplementation of zinc in the um, respiration conditions, but decreased mitochondrial membrane uh, potential with the rest. Um, and so this might be due to the t different tolerances that yeast might have for different concentrations of metals. So in the future work, I'd like to see um, uh, different yeast types being used, as well as different concentrations of zinc and copper. And the implications of this work is that um, supplementation of yeasts um, can be used to optimize the fermentation process. And this is especially important for industrial brewing where time is money. And also, um, I didn't mention this before, but uh, yeast also can play a very important contribution to the flavoring of the beer. So um, supplementation with metals um, could alter the metabolism enough to um, alter the flavor profile of that beer. So it'd be fun to look into that in the future. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Paul, Professor John Hugh, you guys contribute a lot to my understanding of this topic. Um, Daniel Martin, Wayne from the stock rooms, you guys are awesome. You guys help me a lot with procuring stuff. My Chem 680 cohorts who were just there to really beat into me that I need to work on my presentation skills. Thank you. <laughs> And Julie Jodowski and Jason Park, you guys, listen to me. <laughs> Celestia in my heart. <laughs> Some way in the corner. Like, Thanks, guys. Questions? Oh. Questions? <laughs> you. You there. <laughs> Julia. So, go back to your conclusion or summary slide. Yes, um, ma'am. So why is it that you're seeing decreased mitochondrial membrane potential um, with the copper condition for the YPG, which is supposed to be respiring, and copper, from my understanding, my understanding is enhancing the productivity of from C? I like that question. That's an excellent question. I'll answer that question. <laughs> um, so, as I said, um, the concentration that I use for copper, uh, I only use one concentration in this instance. And so it might be that for these yeasts, their tolerance for this concentration might be a lot less than um, for diff different kinds of yeast like the lager, which saw an increase. So it could very well be that the concentration is too high and that might actually prove to have a cytotoxic effect on these yeasts in particular. Did I answer your question? Can I just ask kind of an extension of that of course. question? Um, so what range, if, if you were going to test more concentration, what range would you, would you like to go higher and lower or just lower? Is this on the upper limit of what you would like to use? And then also, how did you actually introduce it? Is it in what form did it come in? Like, is it a salt? Is it? I introduced it in a salt, or I should probably answer this in chronological order. OK. Um, <laughs> Well, because I noticed some to cytotoxic effects, or what I presume to be, what I think is cytotoxic effects with some but not others, I think this would probably be more on the upper range of the concentration I've used, but I would still go further up and lower as well to look at the limits of supplementation. Um, also, uh, I introduced them in the form of salt, so I put them into the nutrient broth before introducing the yeast. What's the other one? Huh? It's the salt, so oh, the chloride. copper, what? Chloride. I tried to find 
sulfate, but I couldn't find it in the stopper, so I just went with the chloride. <laughs> Even though they don't look that different, the numbers are different. So it's just the matter of the axes I use. I think that's the problem. If you were to, is this just like one? I know it's 10,000 cells, but it's going to be mean of a distribution. Yeah. And so it is technically just one number. If you run it again and again and again, do you get the same geometric mean? Do you mm -hmm. have any idea of the sense of variance, even if it's the same sample? Um, no, I don't have, I don't have to answer that. Um, but, uh, when, you, when, when I run it again, because um, I did this several times, but I just like, um, I can't like show different sets of data from different sample runs because of that variance of fluorescence is going to fluctuate enough that it just wouldn't make sense to compare them like that. So, you so I have to look at now. one entire like experiment, one entire run of these things sure. to glean any significant meaning from that, or not significant in the statistical sense, but yes. Um, so I think I remember. Um, so, you were looking at uh, comparing respiration conditions with the glycerol and the fermentation conditions with the glucose, but how, how are you controlling that? Like, how are you controlling those conditions? Like, it had to be anaerobic versus aerobic conditions, yeah. so. so. You just didn't say it, that's why I was curious. Oh, okay, so, aerobic, cap off. Okay. Aerobic. Or anaerobic cap on. <laughs> I, I mean, I just wanted to know the details. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Thank the speaker one more time. 